top contenders in that race mm. will be the senators and the uh, House of Reps members will be deciding who will be and who uh, who and who will be principal officers in both chambers of the National Assembly. We have Abdulaziziari, former governor of Zamfara State, mm -hmm. and Gotu Lakpabio, former governor of Akwa Ibom State at the Senate. And also in the House of Representatives, we have Tajidina Baz, the consensus candidate of the APC, coming against the former deputy speaker of the House of Representatives, Idris Wasi. And so we'll see how all that will play out today. Yes, aside the presidential election and the governorship and state houses of assembly election, this is the next big thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's looking forward to today to see what happens. Yes, yeah. and, and it's central. Uh, the presidency, the executive mm -hmm. is very interested in, in who emerges eventually. Expectedly uh, so, because I mean, you know how it is uh, for to ensure smooth running of the National Assembly and even smooth running of the country because, you know, uh, it's only expected that the president should be interested in who emerges so that, you know, that relationship, when he says stuff, bills, uh, requests to the National Assembly, he gets the support and all of that. So and that, it's expected. Uh, yes, and we are already seeing the fruits of that, you know, smooth relationship, which is a beautiful thing, actually, mm -hmm. because you don't want a back and forth between the legislature and the executive eventually, because that will frustrate a lot uh, of uh, progress, if you like, mm. uh, of the country. We are already seeing a bill that was sponsored by the former Speaker of the House yes. of Representatives. The student loan bill yeah. was signed by the President yesterday already. And so uh, you could say that that's, you know, that closeness between the Speaker that and relationship the, yes, and to the, the, the president seemed to have materialized in the passing of that bill is part of the president Bola Tinubu's campaign promises and already we are seeing that that has come into play already so it seems like it wasn't just a promise for the campaigns Mm. Uh, but it's something that has been that have been in the works because I mean the the bill was sponsored by the speaker of the the former speaker at this point, mm -hmm. uh, Femi Majabia Mila. Yeah, and, look and at I how think swift, a lot. I look at how swift you know. Yes, it just, even uh, it passed very quickly, and then it was signed into law very quickly as well. And I think a lot of students will be happy because. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we'll see how students will benefit from this and uh, we we'll also are expecting to see the modalities of how some of these things will play out. Yeah. Uh, we understand that according to the provisions of the bill, there's this uh, education bank. That there's education bank and then and then the loan is interest free. You, you pay back exactly what you take. So uh, indigent students can actually say, OK, fine, let me take this, go to school. And then when I work, I pay back yes. as it's done in other climbs, actually. Yes. So you, you start paying two years after your uh, NYSC. Uh, after your NYSC. But my question is, Stella, if after your NYSC, two years later, you, still you don't, don't get a job. A job I, I, you, but we're hoping for a better Nigeria. <laughs> we're, we're, we're hoping, you know. Well, we'll see we're, how we're that looking goes. forward to a better Nigeria <laughs> where after school you get a job. Uh, That's what we're looking forward uh, to now. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Let me not yeah. be a pessimist mm -mm. Uh, here. Well, let's take a look at the headlines that we have this morning before us. Allow National Assembly members choose their leaders. Northern elders caution Tinubu. CDD urges uh, Nigerians to rededicate to democratic ideals. June 12, quick steps for Nigerian students to access loan scheme. Now let's take a look at the details. The Northern Elders Forum has issued a caution to President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, urging him to respect the principle of separation of powers and allow the 10th National Assembly members to elect their leaders. According to the forum, the legislature is an independent body and the presidency must refrain from intervening in their leadership elections. Dr. Hakim Baba Ahmed, Director of Publicity and Advocacy for the Northern Elders Forum, expressed his concerns during the press briefing in response to a statement made by Vice President Kashim Shatima. The Vice President had remarked that the most incompetent Southern Christian is better than the most puritanical Northern Muslim as Senate President. Dr. Hakim criticized the Vice President's statement, particularly considering that it came from a respected Northern Muslim with a notable political career. He explained that the forum had repeatedly urged President Tinubu's administration to uphold the rights and privileges of elected members of the legislature in selecting their leaders. 
The Center for Democracy and Development has congratulated Nigerians in commemorating the progress and resilience of the nation's democracy 30 years after the annulled June 12, 1993 election. The CDD director, Idayat Hassan, in a statement on Monday noted that the celebration is the first democracy day after the seventh consecutive transition of power between civil and government. She said that the CDD, as an organization dedicated to promoting democracy and good governance, fully recognizes the importance of citizen participation, transparency, and the protection of human rights in building a strong democratic nation. Now, the CDD uh, boss urged all Nigerians, government institutions, civil society organizations, and the private sector to recommit themselves not only to the ideals of democracy, but also towards the strengthening of democratic institutions, promoting accountability, protecting human rights, and fostering an environment where every citizen, citizen's voice is heard and valued. The signing of the student loan bill into law by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu Monday has elicited commendations from the public, especially students. The bill will enable Nigerian students to access loans as, at interest-free rates. It is also expected to see the establishment of an education bank. The Nigerian Education Bank, which shall have powers to supervise, coordinate, administer, and monitor the management of student loans in Nigeria. The board will also receive applications from students loans through higher institutions in Nigeria on behalf of the applicants, screen the applications to ensure that all requirements for the grant of the student's loan under the Act are satisfied. The bank shall also have the power to approve and disburse the loan to qualified applicants, control and monitor and coordinate the student's loan account and ensure compliance in respect of disbursement, monitor academic records of guarant guarantees of the loan to obtain information on their year of graduation, national service and national service employment to ensure that guarantees of the loan commence repayment of the loan as at when due, among other functions. Right. Now, President Bola Tinubu, members of his government, state governors, heads of security agencies and service chiefs on Monday marked the 30th anniversary of the annulment of the June 12, 1993 presidential election. Kendi Amodu reports that the ceremony featured a parade of guards mounted by detachments of the armed forces in their regimental colors at the forecourt of the presidential villa. Take a look. Thirty years ago, this man was one of those opposing government in a bid to restore the mandate of what was adjudged a free and fair election. It seems befitting that he is today at the head of government after a long-fought battle alongside other prominent Nigerians to restore democracy to the country. The significance is not lost on those present at this event, and many are urging that this hard-fought-for democracy should not be taken for granted. The struggle right that make sure that we can have an enduring democracy and we've had one now that's on way for like 24 years and we're thankful that indeed there's no alternative to democracy and we just need to continue to nurture it continue to continue to build on it whatever our differences are let's all clean it up we are very excited and we know that there is so for the future we will cash in by ensuring peace and then ensuring that we walk towards a secured nation where everybody can sleep with their eyes closed and of course, we bring back prosperity. We produce what we consume, and we consume what we produce, and we are already starting. So democracy has come to stay, and political practitioners like us are excited that we are now also looking like part of other world, part of the world, where democracy, which is government of the people, for the people and by the people. So today we are celebrating our people, celebrating the opportunity given to us by God. But the question to ask is if this ceremony is enough to honor Moshud Abiola, who paid the ultimate sacrifice for refusing to let go of his mandate. Uh, the president, uh, Abiola, is no more. 
we can't bring him back. And uh, whatever we do, we'll never bring him back to life. But we should never forget. We should be inspired by his courage. We should be inspired by his steadfast commitment. And we should be inspired. When that announcement was made, that was long ago, but uh, we give glory to God uh, that today yeah, we are celebrating uh, uh, this very important landmark in the history of our country. Remember, it was in 2019 that President Muhammad Buhari declared June 12 a work free day. Aside from President Pitinumbu inspecting the parade of guards, he and other dignitaries were thrilled to varieties of military displays and artistic drills. There was also a variety of dance drama and displays showcasing the cultural diversity of Nigeria. From State House Abuja, Kaindi Amudu, Trust TV News. All right, thank you, Kendi Amodo, for that report. Still on the Democracy Day celebration, June 12th annulment by the military has taken Nigeria back. As the country celebrates Democracy Day, Kano residents expressed this view in an interview with Trust Television. Our correspondent Idris Jibri reports that the residents also asked the federal government to strengthen the electoral process to further consolidate on democratic gains. Let's take the report. On June 12, 1993, Late Moshud Abiola was declared the winner of the Nigeria's presidential election, which was later annulled by the military administration of General Ibrahim Babangida. Former President Muhammadu Buhari declared June 12 as public holiday and as a democracy day in Nigeria. The importance of June 12 is that for, for that side, Buhari do well to make the whole Nigeria know what has been happening before. You understand? Mm. Mm, uh, this June 12th, the whole world knows about it. Say it's free and fair election. The best election ever we've had in this Nigeria up to date was stolen. Stolen mandate from Abiola. The only, the freest and fairest election we had and was denied from him. But some resident in Kano say there is nothing to celebrate about June 12th or Democracy Day in Nigeria, given the controversy that surrounded the June 12 elections. Well, lie to lie, I don't know about today's day, public holidays. I was in my, I don't leave my office when they say there is no work. So I never know because this is my first, first time. experience that today it's been a June 12th, two of us. Although public holiday is being observed in Kano, as in many other parts of the country, but Nigerians believed that things could have been different if the mandate had been given to Abiola in 1993. We cannot entirely discard June 12. One, Abiola and Bashir Topa are no more. We supported uh, Bashir Topa. Nevertheless, we would have loved it if the election as it was free and fair and was given to the person who won the election. While Nigerians use this day to celebrate their democracy, experts argued that June 12 should be given much priority by the federal government so as to demonstrate clear concern over the annulment of the 1993 presidential elections. Idris Jubrin, Trust TV News, Kanu. Uh, in a similar vein, June 12 holds a special place in the hearts of many Nigerians as it symbolizes a vital moment in the nation's history. Since 1999, Nigeria has enjoyed uninterrupted democratic governance. So citizens in Delta State uh, uh, bear their minds on the journey so far in Asaba. Jonathan Awanye reports. As Nigeria marks her 24th uninterrupted democracy anniversary in Asaba, mixed reactions have trailed the journey so far. In an interview with Trust TV, former Minister of Information, Professor Sam Oyobaire said there is little to celebrate about Nigeria's democratic growth. Maintenance, maintenance of existing infrastructure. It's not been impressive. Whether you're talking about health, where, as everybody knows, you see a huge exodus, exit 
or did they call it Jackpa, you know, <laughs> a lot of our young men and women that have been trained in the country, leaving us, you know, which tells you that there is huge deficits in that sector. Speaking on the development, residents urge government at all levels to add value to the lives of the people. The, the, my message to Nigerians is that they should be prayerful so that uh, at least uh, the leaders, they will remember to do well. So that the leaders, especially when I've been the leaders, especially those ones at the, at the, at the, in Abuja, so that they will remember to do well now that uh, they, they're taking over, so that by the special grace of God, we will no longer have this uh, insecurity, we will no longer have this impoverishment of the people. Uh, we just have to pray God. The of the president of this country that remove resources which is our prayer in all this way. That means that we are going to have a better Nigeria in moving forward. Others who spoke said it has been a steady progress towards attaining democracy the way it should be. All right, now let's look at other matters. The bill passed by the Ninth Sokoto State House of Assembly regulating marital expenses has been generating misreaction in the state, with some residents of the state re expressing fear that it is th that is only targeted at the poor. Abaka Awal Imam reports that the law has been receiving praises and knocks since it was passed in May this year. Let's take a look. On May. 9, 2023, Sokoto State House of Assembly passed into law the amended Sokoto Marital Expenses Law. The law named Regulation and Control of Expenses of Marriages, naming as circumcision ceremonies and for purposes connected therewith 2022, was aimed at checkmating extravagances associated with marriage, among other things. Our findings reveal that the least one can spend on his wedding is about one million naira, regardless of his financial status. This involves purchasing cartons of exotic drinks, sweets, and some token cash gifts to the bride in the name of ICI Love, the payment of dowry, and at least a set of bags containing tens of different clothing materials, jewelry, shoes, and cosmetics, among others. The kind of uh, prohibitions, the timing for the marriage is also being controlled a sizable number and I believe that is also a very good one. We go a long way in creating, uh, in reducing competition between the fair groups. Somebody will do more than 130, 20 box, um, boxes of uh, provisions for the marriage. But I believe now one that's uniform rate, that's going to be uh, a reduction of, a drastic reduction of competition among the fair groups. The new law However, limit ICI law expenses to only two cartons of sweet with 20,000 cash gift to the bride, but there was no limitation to dowry. The law, which is targeting only Muslims, also packed bridal clothes locally known as Kailepi to only 10 rappers, just as it stipulates one month imprisonment with an option of 50,000 naira for any person who violates the law. Also, calling more important is the state government to ensure implementation of this law because when you don't spend above your means, you are not likely going to be looking for loans and you are not even going to likely to engage in stealing or banditry because when you spend the money that you don't have and you want to pay, you will go into anything in order to get that money and pay back that money. While some residents of the state see it as a welcoming development, or the fears that it will only act on the poor. It's when you have that you spend and uh, it's not mandatory for you when you are getting married or on naming ceremony for you to do some certain outrageous expenses. It depends on the family, it depends on the background, it depends also on the orientation and also the belief. It depends on the self-esteem of both parties, either that of the wife or the husband uh, that are into that celebration. And uh, I want to believe that those that are going to make those laws are mostly also at the top and they are the ones that will break that law. Believe you me, they are the only ones that can spend that kind of outrageous figure that we are talking about. A renowned Islamic scholar in the state, Sheikh Issa Telatamapura, who spoke with our reporter on phone, said the law contravenes Sharia law. Abu Bakar Awal Imam reporting for Trust TV. 
All right, now it's time for us to take a quick break. When we return, the daybreak will continue. Join us again. Dear residents of our beautiful capital city of Abuja, I know we all desire to have a world-class city with working infrastructure and clean streets. That is why the Federal Capital Territory Administration is investing a lot of resources and manpower to ensure prompt evacuation of refuse from all nooks and crannies of the city. Now, this can only be sustained if all residents play their part by promptly paying their waste collection bills. Encourage everyone around you to be patriotic and pay their bills. The task of keeping Abuja clean is for all of us. Remember, soup we sweet, na moniki This message is from the Federal Capital Territory Administration.
necessarily uh, tribal or regional. Oh, All right. Now, thank you for staying with us. You're watching Daybreak on Trust TV, reaching you from Abuja. It's time for us to take a look at the dailies on Daybreak, and we'll begin with the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. The lead story on Daily Trust newspaper. It has a kika, National Assembly inauguration. It says, Apabio Yari Abbas Wasi slug it out today. The writers, four presiding officers to emerge 469 lawmakers to vote, security beefed up. You also have above the lead story, June 12, family seeks Abiola's presidential entitlements from Tinubu on page 6. Nigeria's bonds search after a Mephiles sack on page 23. You also have below the lead story, Tinubu signs student's loan bill into law. It says 21 killed in fresh plateau attack. Bandits slaughter chickens, prepare food during attacks on Niger villages. Then you have the pictorial showing you the major contenders in uh, seeking the uh, principal offices of the National Assembly today. Well, that's that for the Daily Trust this morning. And now let's take a look at the Guardian newspaper and the uh, lead story is still on the leadership of the National Assembly. We have a lead story that says lawmakers edgy in last minute battle for Senate leadership. And we also have heavy rains leave Lagos roads in shambles. Up about 500 billion naira lost to Anchor Bora's program. Beneath that we have a story on the constitutionality of fines by NBC other agencies. And on the foreign scene, former Italian Prime Minister Berlusconi dies at 68. And just beneath the masthead, we have 52% of Nigerian professionals considering migration survey uncovers. Indigent students to assess education loans as tenable science law. These are the major stories on the Guardian newspaper for today. All right. Now let's take a look at the Nation newspaper this morning where you have the lead story that says consensus Senate President, House Speaker, likely today. Lawan Kalu Izunaso endorse Akpabio Abbas support uh, base swells. You also have above the masthead there, NDIC Act has 35 doctored clauses, Chairman claims. New law gives indigent students access to loans. You also have uh, Democracy Day. President reviews guards at Villa, MKO's running mate, activist, state governments, Mark Day in FCT, and others. You have also FAC ask NNPCL to refund 2.1 trillion naira deducted from subsidy. These are the major stories on the Nation newspaper today. Over now to the Punch newspaper. The lead story is still on the leadership of the National Assembly. National Assembly APC anointed candidates, rebels to slog it out today. Then we have a rider, Yari. Others fail to step down for Akpabu Abbas as leadership poll holds. Uh, Isunazo Musa withdraw. Lawan endorses Akpabu after a tenable meeting. And beneath that we have PDP, Buhari's years of low cost of locust wrecked oil sector. This is according to Kokori. And we also have custom seized over 100 smuggled SUVs. We have road cops extort 153,000 from undergraduates. CP removes DPO. And just uh, above the masthead, anti graph groups want NDIC probed. ASU, ASU expressed doubt over student loan. Family demands presidential entitlements for Abiola. These are the major stories on the Punch newspaper. All right. Well, you have uh, other stories on the Vanguard newspaper, where the lead story has a kicker on inauguration. It says, Power show as 10th NAS gets underway today. You have above the masthead, June 12, Abiola was forerunner to entrench democracy tenets in Nigeria, King Gibe says. You have Atrax, 
stop eating pomo, bush meat, FG tells Nigerians. June 12th, INEC APC does honored Abiola's memory, says PDP. You also have uh, no, no witch hunt in cancelling employment of 12,000 civil servants, says Governor Alaya. Well, these are the major stories on the Vanguard newspaper. So we understand that the inauguration at the National Assembly has commenced and we have our correspondent live there for us. Let's uh, take a look at happenings at the National Assembly. Of the National Assembly CNA, the clerk of the Senate, distinguished colleagues, senators elect. My name is Senator Ishiaku Abo. I represent the good people of Adamawa North in the 10th Senate. I rise on my feet to nominate distinguished senator elect Abulaziz Yari to do take the chair in the Senate as the president of the 10th Senate. Distinguished colleagues, Senator Abulaziz Yari was born on 5th January 1969 in Talata Mafara, Zamfara State. Abulaziz Yari, of course, is the immediate past governor of Zamfara State, though not very immediate. He served between 2011 to 2019 on the platform of APC, ANPP, which subsequently became the APC. As I said earlier, he was born in Zamfara State. He attended Talata Mafara Township Primary School, went to Government Teachers College Bakura, Zamfara State, attended Sokoto State Polytechnic, then Sokoto State, and went also to KB Polytechnic for his higher national diploma. Distinguished Senator Ablaziz Yari is a alcoholic, detribalized Nigerian, an honest man, gentleman to the core, and with this, I have the honor of presenting to the 10 senators elect, distinguished Senator Ablaziz Yari, to do take the chair as the president of the 10th Senate. I so move. No point of order. No point of order. And based on this, based on such a city of the constitution, these rules were made. As order three, sub rule two, sub rule one, two, and three is very clear and unambiguous as to the as to who is eligible to be president of the Senate. So we must go by the literal interpretation of order three, rule two, sub rule one, two, and three. 
the constitution is the grand norm of the land and therefore we should be we should abide by the provision of the constitution because whatever we do in respect of this nomination is an exercise in futility why should we waste the precious time of the senate mr clark let us say for the record for the record for the record, because whatever we do is an exercise in futility. You cannot put something on. Assembly, very distinguished. The clerk of the National Assembly, the clerk of the Senate, my very distinguished. Or the Federal Republic of Nigeria. My name is Jimo Fono Ibrahim. From Ondo South, I second the nomination on the floor raised by Senator Abo. The clerk of the National Assembly. Uh, Dr. Jimo Ibrahim, Commander of the Order of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Senator elect out Central District, I second the motion on the nomination made by Senator Abo in respect of the chair of the Senate nominating Ablaziz Yari. I so second. <laughs> Mr. Clark, <clears throat> distinguished colleagues, Armen Ablaziz Awakariari, I represent the good people of Zampara West, Mr. Clark, I'm from Zampara State. I first accept the nomination of Ishako Abo to take the seat of the Senate President of the 10th National Assembly. Mr. 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 Clark. Yeah, what you can see on the floor there is a, a little uh, misunderstanding, so to say. But the issue is that after El Senator Elisha Abu from Adama State nominated uh, Ablaziz Yari to stand in as candidate for uh, the office of President of the 10th Senate, uh, some of the senators raised point of order. But however, the other standing orders of the Senate provide that there's nothing like motion, raising of motion or petitions on, on a day like this. But they are saying that uh, Senator Ablaziz is not qualified to contest for the candidate of uh, President of the Senate because he's not a former senator. But from the standing rules that we have here, order two, subsection two says senators who had been members of the House of Representatives can as well stand in as candidate of President of the Senate. 
please, order, please. Okay. Order, please. Are there further nominations? Are there further nominations? Are there further nominations? Three times. I've said it. In the absence of further nominations, I declare nominations closed. The next. That is the clerk to the National Assembly, uh, Magaji Tambowal, just announcing that uh, only two candidates have been nominated so far. So he has declared the nomination closed. But what is uh, interesting here is that two uh, other candidates, who as of yesterday were still interested, the chief, former chief whip of the Senate, Ojiz Okalo and Osita Isna, so it appears they've all stepped down. We are now going to proceed for the election. And election is in accordance with Order 3, Sub 3, E. Now, I will now call the clerk of the Senate. Where, okay, where are the ballot papers? Show the, where are the box? Where is all this? Show them, nothing in the... Yeah. The, the ballot papers, you will, you will wait, you will be signing, you will be signing at the back, hey, you, then you give him, show them, show them the ballot papers, oh, We have two cubicles, one at the right, one at the left. You now collect your, when they call your name, you come forward to collect your ballot paper, go and write the name clearly of the candidate of your choice, come and cast your vote. I will now call the clerk of the Senate to call state by state, district, senatorial district, on alphabetical order. Clerk of the Senate. No, no. no. So I proceed. I proceed. The clerk to the National Assembly. I now proceed. Not, not now. Not after voting. After voting, please. The clerk to the National Assembly. I now proceed to call on Senators to come for voting. We'll start with Abia State. Low Culture Darlington. Come forward, please. Carlo Oje Uzo. Abaribe Enyinaya Hakot. Adamawa State. Well, um, yes, we have been uh, uh, watching the uh, proceedings of the National Assembly uh, Senate to uh, be exact. Of course, they are beginning to vote. Uh, that signals the beginning of the election of uh, the leaders of the uh, 10th National Assembly, uh, particularly the Senate, which is uh, taking place at the moment. Uh, but for now, we have to, uh, we have to appreciate our. Uh, our guests who have been with us on the on the program this morning. Yes, but, uh, but Kiria, just before we sign them mm -hmm. off, I return uh, to the live feed from the National Assembly. I, I, I would like to ask Honorable Farouk Adamu uh, what he thinks is playing out 
uh, because we saw some visuals and listened mm. uh, to uh, the uh, proceedings on, on the floor of, of the Senate uh, for, for a while. Earlier, our correspondent had indicated to us that uh, the proceedings would commence. <laughs> All right, you're watching Daybreak on Trust TV, reaching you from Abuja, Nigeria's capital. We just saw at the Red Chambers where there was a rowdy session. Lawmakers are nominating uh, those that will be contesting for the seat of the Senate president and it was a rowdy session, uh, sort of with senators going back and forth, raising uh, uh, point of orders as regards whether or not uh, some of the candidates are qualified, specifically the former governor of the for a state Ablazi Siari, whether or not he's qualified to be nominated for the seat of the Senate president uh, there. So uh, expectedly so, really, uh, given the fact that you have several camps uh, and all eyeing that same seat. The APC has a consensus candidate in the person of God's will like Pabio. And we are going to be going back to see how it's all uh, going to play out today. But the maneuvers is something that has seemed to have come to stay now in uh, the inauguration of lawmakers, not just in at the national level, but at the sub-national level. This is an event that was meant to start at 10 a.m., uh, but it's starting much earlier than uh, as, as said. And in some states, like in the Sarawak state, we understand also we've had situations where the venue for the inauguration is, you know, should be the traditional uh, chambers, but then sometimes it's taken to a different location. Just I remember the last kind one. of last minute maneuvers. I, I remember too. last time in Plateau State, it was supposed to start at 10 and then it started at 6 a.m. Mm. Some persons were unable to make it mm. before the election was conducted, you know. So it looks like these are all plans uh, to. Yeah, but you know, Ayub, to, as I was watching the that. Finals, so people do not participate in but, the decision making. But I, as I was watching that, I felt that was the beauty of democracy, right? Like, for instance, if every member of the APC had agreed with the decision of the APC, then we won't see this kind of robust. Uh, you know, debate, well, I don't want to call it a mm. uh, rancorous session. I want to say robust debate and all of that. So at the end of the day, whoever emerges will feel that, okay, I fought for this and yeah. I got it. Yeah, well, let's get some more perspectives. We have in the studio Dr. Theophilus Abba, the Director of Programs, uh, Daily Trust Foundation with us here. Thank you so much, Doctor, Thank for you very joining much. us this Thank morning. Mm. Yeah, uh, well, your take on what's happening right now at the National Assembly. Well, um, I think, um, like you said in the introductory remarks, it was quite interesting. But uh, what I noticed is that uh, if there were transparency in the process, you know, you wouldn't uh, have that kind of rancor. For instance, I, I didn't expect, I saw whereby um, uh, Yari will be, will be prevented, or somebody will say Yari should not contest because and he was not a senator when the rules, somebody ought to have known the rules that if you were a House of Representatives uh, member, then you qualify to contest for the I mean, any position in the Senate. Somebody is not something that you know should be debated, it's something that should be given because everybody who went there should know the rules of engagement. Yeah. So, I think, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, you know, <clears throat> there's supposed to be transparency in the process, you know, <clears throat> and I fear that. If there was a top-down uh, decision process, 
whereby some persons will say we are the bosses, we are the kingmaker, I mean we are the uh, we, are, we are the leaders of this party, and we decide for the National Assembly members. Mm. You know what it takes to be in the National Assembly is a measure of independence in thinking. Yes. You know, so you shouldn't have a show whereby some people will decide for these people who are supposed to be elders. I say, look, we are telling you who should be your Senate president, we are telling you who should be your deputy, we are telling you who should be your speaker. Mm. You know, you must accept it. Yeah. It shouldn't but, be so. But, but the decision, you know, so that is, the decision that. of the APC, for instance, to endorse some certain people, uh, the claim is that it's done in the interest, is in national, in the, in the interest of the country but, to foster unity. Is there anything like endorsement in the, yeah. in the room? There's nothing like endorsement. In, there could be consensus mm. about the consensus should be among the lawmakers. It's not for the party to say, oh, this is your, your speaker. Now, you see, we, we are learning... But, but they well, feel that if they don't do that, then it, it, it's possible that it's not going to go the way of, you know, in a way that is going to promote unity in the country. So, for instance, if you have <coughs> Ayari now contesting for the Senate president's seat, and he eventually emerge as Senate president, what's the implication of that in terms of the structure, in terms of having the first top five? This is the argument that the presidency is making, that if you have you know, the, the president and his vice being uh, of the same faith, and you also have the Senate president of the same faith, it's likely also you could have the Speaker of the House of Representatives of same faith. And, mm. you know, that could not uh, really speak well of well, the issue a, of... Yes, that is the argument know, that um, has come up because of the uh, step that the PPC took by shielding a Muslim-Muslim ticket. That is why we're having all this... Uh, uh, challenges. But what I'm arguing is this, you know, the, the lawmakers, the senators, you know, are, are, should, are, should have on their own decided. It's not like the executive will now tell the but, legislator. But Dr. Hubbard, you know, some, experts, some experts have said that the executive did not tell the legislature, go and vote for this person, that the party came together and said, okay, let's talk. Mm. What, so, so we had somebody here yesterday who said that what has been going on, in his view, is engagement, mm. that the executive members of the party have been engaging with lawmakers. Because at the mm. end of the day, the lawmakers can go to the floor today and do what they want to do. Don't you think so? You see, they, they, they've been engaging uh, with the lawmakers. Uh, that, is, that is the language you use. But then the engagement, you know, can be interpreted as an imposition. When you say, okay, this is the person we want, that, you see, my, what I'm driving at is the fact that there ought to be, um, what, what do you call it, Se uh, separation of powers. You understand? Where the executive and the legislature should oversee each other. Now, if the... Um, the executive decided who becomes the head of the legislature. It means that whatever the executive takes to the legislature will be endorsed. And we have seen it in the last five years. Where anything that comes from the president, the former president, is automatically seen to have come from God. So it must be approved. And I, 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 I don't think that is, that, that is what the, I mean, the lawmaking is all about. You, because you are supposed to have oversight function over the executive. You are supposed to say, okay, executive, this which you are doing is not right. This is how it ought to be. You are supposed to interrogate the executive. You don't just say, okay, so far you have come from the president. Well, he helped me to become the Senate president. He helped me to become the Senate president. Anything he brings, we sign. Mm. And in the last five years, mm. there, are, there were things that were missing. For those of us who have been monitoring this, I mean, the legislature over the years, it, there was no proper investigation. No investigative activity has taken place. Now that Buhari has left, we are hearing all sorts of, you know, um, uh, reports about all sorts of uh, things that went wrong. Mm. And the body that is supposed to say, okay, this is not how it should be done. This must be done rightly. That, that body, that is the National Assembly, abdicated this responsibility. Okay. And, okay. That, and that is what I think should not happen. Okay, because as long as the executive cannot be put on their toes, as long as they can do whatever they want, they take whatever bill to the House, to the National Assembly, it gets passed. Whatever policy they come up with, nobody interrogates, it gets passed. We'll keep on... I mean, stumbling from um, one crisis or, okay. or to another. Doctor, I, I still want you to talk about this, you know, uh, maneuvering and this uh, seeming attempt to, you know, deny some lawmakers of participating in the process. Uh, I, I'm saying this because in recent times we are having experiences. Uh, before the emergence of uh, uh, Bukola Saraki, the, the, 
the former Senate president. We saw the maneuvers that happened at that time between ICC, the National Assembly, some people went for something at the ICC and then mm. like that, like that. In the process, that was how uh, Bukola Saraki emerged because some people were not there to vote. Mm. Uh, and we have seen that this is taking a different dimension also at the sub-national level. Some governors uh, have gone to the extent of, you know, having a different venue for the inauguration where some of the lawmakers will be allowed access into that venue and they will be the ones to vote and they decide the speaker and that has resulted in what we now have in Nasarawa State, two mm. speakers. Uh, we had one election at the local government secretariat and the other at the state assembly and all that. This is definitely not going to go well for us, is but it? It's, it's not good for, for our democracy because it seems or it is obvious that the executive, and like, like I said, wants to impose its own lackey, you know, on the, on the legislation, which should not be so. You see, it, there's nothing wrong with multiple contestants. For instance, if we, if, we, if, we, if we go back to what happened in the UK in the last two years, you had about seven persons wanting to be prime minister, for instance. Then, you know, they passed through process one, process two, process three. There was elimination process. You know, some people voted for you. You didn't have enough votes. You didn't have so, so. Then it boils down to maybe two persons. Then after that, the two, I mean, the members of um, the House of Commons will now vote for these two persons and choose their leader. Now, if you don't come and say, oh, you have zero in on one person. But, but it's a good thing you brought the, uh, the UK example. Yes. But then, then talk about the US example, where the party decided that it was going to be McCarthy. And it took 40 rounds. They, they could not get the, 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 everybody to get him. Mm. They, they insisted. They continued mm. until they were able to vote him. So what do you say to that? That, okay, that, is, that is also to tell you that it's in spite of the position of the, of the executive, you know, the party is not the executive anyway. But it's not a position of the executive. The people who should decide are the lawmakers. You understand? But what we are seeing, and what I perceive from what's going on now, is that, oh, the executive has said, this person is the one. If you oppose him, we will not, I mean, it, it's like if you oppose him, you are committing uh, what, an offense. We should, not, we should not be so. You know, I'm thinking that even if you even if you have interest in a candidate, allow him to go and test his popularity among his people. It's not to impose him, not to say everybody must fall in line, you must do this, you must do that, and all this it, that is not the right thing to do. But in but the, doctor, the, the two like major this. candidates now of the of the of for seeking the position are mm. both members of the same party. Yes. So I think um, I I I I um, I think Yari his tenacity is uh, is is quite good for democracy. You understand? So the fact that we need to balance, um, what do you call it, the religion and regional uh, um, uh, equation. You know, we need to balance it. But I don't think there's anything wrong if we say, okay, this thing goes to the south, for instance. I don't think there's anything wrong in multiple uh, contestants from the south. Most of we come from, uh, yeah, if you say we have zoned this to the south, then allow them to decide. You know, it's not for you to say, okay, you must step down for this, you mustn't go and do, you mustn't do this, you mustn't that. And that's what we've seen in the last few days. What I call maybe a major of intimidation. And that is why what I mean, Yari is doing is good for our democracy. I'm not saying that he must be voted in as the Senate president, but there has to be a contest. Mm. Mm. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Theophilus, for joining us on Daybreak and sharing your perspectives with us.